ladies and gentlemen, please join me in putting our hands together to welcome our keynote speaker, panelists, moderators, and official for today's event. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to all of you. I'm Desmond Chong, an NYA Go Award holder and a volunteer with the NYA Council. It is my pleasure to be your MC for today. And a very warm welcome to the St. Garland Symposium 2020 Singapore Forum. And as the MC, I have the privilege of setting some ground rules. And uh, in today's digital economy, all of you have at least one smartphone with you. Some have two. Uh, and if you're like me, who's uh, trying to avoid spring cleaning for Chinese New Year, you probably would have kept your phone in the car. But for those of you who didn't, uh, can I ask that you turn your phone to silent mode so that when we're having a very active dialogue later on, we won't have some funny 70s music going on in the back of the hall. So thank you for that. To begin this morning's event, I'd like to invite Mr. Biet Ulrich, Chief Executive Officer, St. Garland's Foundation, to deliver his welcome address. Mr. Ulrich, please. So, dear panelists, dear Ambassador Filier, Ambassador of Switzerland here to Singapore, dear Alexander Malkers, our special advisor here to Singapore, dear James, dear Eileen, dear Viswa, dear students, dear ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to the fifth St. Gallen Symposium Singapore Forum, also from my side. Today's event should generate food for thought and network towards the symposium's global conference, which we'll hold in May this year. And this will be the 50th jubileum of the St. Gallen Symposium. Our initiative was founded back in 1969. When five students from our university said that it's better to create a dialogue, a discussion, than to demonstrate. So they founded the St. Gallen Symposium, which today is the world's leading student-run initiative for fruitful discussions across generations. Today, almost 50 years since the foundation of the symposium, we believe that the importance of tackling challenges by bridging generations is bigger than ever. For more than 20 years, Singapore has played an important role in the St. Gallen Symposium's development, both on a global but also on a regional level here in Southeast Asia. This would not have been possible without the tremendous support by NYAAC, and on a more personal level by Mr. James So, the Executive Director, and Eileen Yap. Dear James, we in St. Gallen are all extremely grateful for everything you have done for us during the past years. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big hand to Mr. James So and Eileen Yap. So the idea today is really to, to create the Southeast Asian perspective on our topic uh, for next May. And that's why we are looking forward to inspiring words and most interesting discussions. Thank you all for coming. And I guess I can hand over the word uh, to the ambassador or, or back uh, to you here. And hope to see you all next May in Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ulrich. Actually, he introduced our next speaker for me already. And if all our speakers does that for me, that would really be good. Uh, but then, James will say, then, Desmond, you're technically out of a job. And just before Chinese New Year, when you're out of a job, is really a bad thing, you know. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mr. Ulrich. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ambassador of Switzerland to Singapore, His Excellency, Mr. Fabrice Felice, to address us, please. Mr. Ambassador. Your Excellencies, dear guests, dear friends. It's a privilege today for me to say a few words to open this fifth edition of the St. Gallen Symposium Singapore Forum. I would like to personally thank also James So for his <coughs> continuous and unconditional support. Freedom revisited. I think this is the most philosophical topic I have seen for a St. Gallen Symposium. It is though refreshing that such a topic 
forces us to rethink about fundamental values we too often take for granted. Today's topic is, more, is not about the future of freedom. It is about how we revisit freedom today. The philosophical conundrum with freedom is that it should always be first. If you put freedom second, it becomes dependent upon other values and is not freedom anymore. In other words, if you put it second, you defeat its very purpose. So we have freedom first. But what kind of freedom? Political, economical, religious, security? The question seems paradoxical, but is necessary to discuss if we want to achieve greater freedom. One of the most influential Swiss philosophers of all times gave the following description when he wrote in 1762, man is born free, but everywhere he goes, he's in chains. In his social contract, Jean-Jacques Rousseau explains that to form a society, men must give up part of their liberties in order to create a greater freedom. This is what is applied in any organization, whether a country, a company, or even a sports club. You have sets of rules which define your rights and duties. These are based on values, and as values change over time, freedom is revisited over time. Another important Swiss thinker, Benjamin Constant, studied this thoroughly. He lived a few decades after Rousseau and is, in his most famous speech, the liberty of ancients compared with that of moderns. He tells that a long time ago in ancient Greece, citizens had a very high freedom to participate in collective power. People would gather and decide whether they should go to war, how they wanted to use the state's budget, and if they should grow more olive trees or grapevine. But, however, they were limited in the exercise of their individual freedoms. The moderns of the 19th century, explains Constant, have more individual freedoms in comparison. They are more free to use their time and money the way they want. In return, they delegate collective decisions to a representative government. Citizens hold accountable and give trust to statesmen who make decisions on budget, infrastructure, education, and so on. How are individual and collective freedoms being redefined today? Two main aspects, technology, multilateralism. Why technology? First, because it makes us revisit individual freedoms. On the one hand, automation frees up some time for us. Time we can use to educate ourselves, spend with friends and family, and enjoy <coughs> in leisure. On the other hand, in our education policies, if our education policies do not promote human intelligence, automation can be an economic threat. Second, technology makes us revisit collective freedoms. What we call big data can lead to optimized policies for all, better public transportation, digital services, safety, but it entails privacy and cybersecurity challenges. Biased algorithm and malicious people can influence our behaviors. A focus on data only and not on citizens' needs can lead to mass surveillance to the detriment of the individuals. As we become more aware of these challenges posed by technology, people plead for clearer terms, conditions, and stronger protections from governments and companies. Why multilateralism? 
we are forced to realize that the biggest challenges today cannot be faced by a single country or a single organization. We must revisit collective freedoms at a global level. Switzerland has been engaging on that front for a long time. There are more than 40 international organizations uh, in what we call International Geneva, Genève Internationale, and over 250 NGOs. From the United Nations to the World Health Organization, the Human Rights Council and the World Economic Forum, which is holding its annual session in Davos next week, with uh, <clears throat> a strong delegation led by Prime Minister Lee on the side of Singapore. In recent times, our government has tried to modernize the multilateral dynamics and open doors to new actors, think tanks, as well as startups in Geneva. We believe that such entities will help connect the dots, bring fresh ideas and concepts, propose different approaches. The Sangalan Symposium is an excellent illustration of a multilateral forum, which constantly strives to bring different people with different minds for an exercise of collective intelligence. Ladies and gentlemen, these considerations may seem very far from our own everyday freedom. But we must understand that a critical issue such as climate change, for example, perhaps the most important multilateral issue of our century, can only be addressed through a renewed form of multilateralism. The use of our individual freedom today has a greater impact on tomorrow's natural disasters and living conditions on Earth. Both Singapore and Switzerland long for a stable multilateral order which we only have, which we do not only have to revisit, but have to further build together based on values we can share for a greater collective freedom. This is what the Sangalan Symposium does. And after 50 years of existence, it has become more relevant than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Okay, it is now my pleasure to invite our keynote speaker, Dr. Kevin Tan, adjunct professor, faculty of law at NUS, as well as visiting professor at S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies at the NTU to deliver the keynote address on the team of the Singalan Singapore, Singalan Symposium 2020 Singapore Forum, Freedom Visited. Dr. Tan, please. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador, Feliz, Viet, CEO of Singalan Symposium, James, CEO of um, NYAA, somebody who I've worked with for a very long time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here, to be asked to give the keynote address. And in a way, I must thank the ambassador for actually doing part of the job for me, because you set out some of the key parameters of the kinds of things that we should be discussing this morning. What I propose to do is perhaps to start with something a little bit more abstract. Because when we talk about freedom, you can talk about it in many, many ways uh, and have multiple meanings to it. And as a result, we may not be able to have a good conversation in that respect. The word freedom is powerful. It is evocative. It is often the battle cry of the oppressed. It is also a regular synonym for the words liberty and democracy. But exactly what do we mean when we speak of freedom? What does a journalist mean when she writes that the freedom of the press has been curtailed? Or does it mean the same thing as when a young protester in central Hong Kong calls upon the world to stand with him in his fight for freedom or to protect Hong Kong's freedom and autonomy? What about the celebrity who pleads for the freedom to be left alone? Or the voter who hunkers hankers for the freedom to choose his or her representative to parliament. The same word is used each time, but in each different context, the meaning is always different. So it may therefore be useful to start by clarifying 
what we mean when we talk about freedom. The word, the word freedom is often used interchangeably with the word liberty, even though they are conceptually different. Right? Freedom is personal to each of us, to each person. It refers to a person's ability to be autonomous, both in thought and deed. It also refers to what we have that goes on between our ears, in our minds. Right? Liberty, on the other hand, is external to each of us. It refers to the condition where one is free within a society from restrictions that may be imposed by that society on our way of life, right? The uh, behavior, uh, our behavior, our political views, and so on. So cast in this manner, it's possible to take away, actually, a person's liberty, but not his freedom, because that's really what you have in here, the autonomy to make decisions that you would like. But for our purposes, let's not uh, get into these uh, philosophical conceptions. Let's just assume that they are synonymous. Liberty, freedom, take it as the same thing. So how do we talk about freedom? We need to make differentiations between two concepts of freedom. The great British political philosopher, Sir Isaiah Berlin, wrote a very important article in 1958 called Two Concepts of Liberty in which he distinguishes between two types of freedom or liberty. And, and Berlin uh, uses it interchangeably as well, freedom and liberty. Right? The first concept he calls negative freedom, the second positive freedom. Quite easy, plus and minus. Uh, negative freedom, he says, refers to the freedom from interference or restriction on one's thought or action. Right? So this usually means that there may be restrictions that may be placed upon your behavior. Right? Um, uh, so, for example, uh, my freedom uh, of movement may be limited by traffic rules uh, that requires me to cross the road only when the, uh, the green man is blinking, uh, that kind of freedom. So there are restrictions uh, to freedom of movement. Right? Um, and uh, uh, similarly, your, your, your freedom to smoke cigarettes or cigars may be restricted by rules that require you to be first above the age of 20 years before you can purchase cigarettes, going up to 21 next year, but uh, 20 at, at the present moment, uh, and where you are allowed to smoke. In fact, there are all these designated places where smoking is allowed. So freedom is constrained right? So uh, by certain impediments. Right? So that, that's what Berlin refers to as uh, a negative freedom. N negative in the sense that I don't have to worry about having these restrictions placed on me. The positive freedom uh, he refers to is freedom to do something or to receive something. Usually, it is about a person's autonomy to direct him or herself in doing what he or she pleases. It is a positive act. So to be positively free is to be able to do what we want without hindrance or restrictions. So when somebody lacks positive freedom, this means that this person lacks ability to determine his or her choice of doing something. So in a context of a state, uh, positive freedom may be curtailed for the benefit of the uh, individual. So for example, young children may not enjoy the positive freedom uh, to do as they please because there is something called compulsory education. So they have to go to school. right? So given these distinctions, maybe it's convenient for us when we talk about freedom to perhaps use it in conjunction with uh, slightly different adjectival verbs. You could talk about freedom from something, freedom from threat, freedom from fear, uh, and freedom to do something, right? Uh, freedom to speak, freedom uh, uh, to vote, and so on. Now, it makes little sense to talk about freedom in the abstract. And any discussion about freedom, whichever way you conceive it, positive or negative, needs to be contextualized. It's possible for us to think of freedom in three different contexts. First, a national context. Second, a political context. And third, an individual context. So let's talk about it at sort of three possible levels. National freedom political freedom and individual freedom. 
So what do we mean by national freedom? National freedom refers to freedom of a state from foreign domination or control. So this is sometimes referred to as sovereignty of the state, independence, for example. So the desire for national freedom, of course, stems from the desire of a people to determine their own destinies. This is called the right of self-determination and to be able to rule themselves without having uh, to deal with interference from foreign uh, powers or laws or control. The second one, political freedom, refers to an individual's freedom to vote, to hold office, to take part in public life, and through its representatives to make laws. Now this freedom comes from the idea that people are sovereign, they have will, they have autonomy, they have independence to determine their own fates. So, so that's political freedom. Also linked to individual freedom. And here it's rather more complex. Right? It refers to our individual rights to live as we choose so long as we do not bring harm to other people. Such freedoms are the ones that are typically enshrined in constitutions and in bills of rights and in international human rights instruments such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on uh, Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Um, Singapore, interestingly, uh, uh, very much endorses the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights because it's not a legal document, it's, uh, it's more a hortatory document, but we are not parties to either the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, ICCPR, nor of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. While each of these contexts uh, are different, the kind of freedoms that are exercised also sometimes intersect with each other. So, for example, the desire to exercise a community's national freedom also involves the, the citizens' political freedom uh, to decide whether or not they want to be independent or they would like to join some other state. Uh, to, to merge two states together. And this is usually done through the process of some kind of national referendum or voting. Right? So you've got both self-determination, national freedom, talking alongside uh, political freedom. Um, historically, um, many of the great civilizations and empires, the Egyptians, the Chinese, the Russians, they, they have actually enjoyed great national freedom, sovereignty, independence, but not necessarily political and independent, uh, individual freedom. Right? And this is why many commentators, scholars, and, and official government officials very often suggest or claim that individual and political freedoms are not a universal value, but are rooted. They grew out of a kind of a Judeo-Christian mentality and a worldview that came from the West. Now, it doesn't matter because this may well be true from the perspective of history, but ever since the establishment of the modern international legal system, the legal order from 1945 after the Second World War, we all now have come to regard various freedoms that are espoused and guaranteed under the major international human rights documents as core to our beings as human beings. Whatever our respective histories, we all now live in a world where states are equal and individuals are expected to be treated equally and with dignity. I'll return to this in a while. But let us first focus our thoughts on individual freedoms. Right? So if we've got national freedoms, political and individual, let's, let's try and unpack the individual freedom bit of it. Now let's say you are marooned on an island all by yourself. You know, pretty much like the character Robin Crusoe in Daniel Defoe's uh, 1719 novel. You're all there by yourself, nobody else around. Um, and so long as you are there all alone on this island, you actually don't need to concern, concern yourself with freedom or liberty because you have absolute freedom and liberty to do whatever you please. You sleep when you want, catch whatever fish you like, eat whatever fruit might kill you, but you know, uh, eat whatever fruits you like and, and so on, because you have no one to account to. In that particular context, when man is alone, a human being is alone, he or she need not worry or concern about the exercise of freedoms because it is absolute. There is nothing to worry about. 
But the moment you have to live with somebody else, and in the uh, novel, Robinson Crusoe decides that he needs a companion, and, and actually there are slave traders on this island, and one of these slaves runs away, and he decides that, well, maybe this guy can be my companion, I'll help to free this guy, and then he becomes a man Friday. He decides to call him Friday because that was the day he helped release this guy. And the moment Friday enters the picture with Robinson Crusoe, then you can't have absolute freedom anymore because if you decide that you want to shout at the top of your voice at any time of the day, you may disturb somebody else's freedom to have a peaceful sleep, for example. If you decide that you want to swing your club in any way you want, well, you might hit somebody. And so you have to think about the context in which freedoms are to be exercised. And that's why uh, we need to set the context in which we are discussing this. And it's very complex today because uh, hitherto a lot of discussions about freedom have existed within a state context. In other words, it's usually about individuals who make claims against the state. Why? Because the state is powerful, right? Uh, but today it's a little bit different. And for a while we actually did not, many of us did not have to worry about national freedoms anymore because, you know, you are sovereign states. Uh, just, just to give you an interesting uh, 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 fun fact, in 1945, when the United Nations was created, there were maybe about 54 states in the world. Today, the United Nations has 193 members. So you've almost, almost four times uh, the number of members, member states in the United Nations. Where, where did they come from? Uh, the world hasn't grown physically. It's the same number of, uh, same amount of land. It's just that uh, with decolonization and self-determination, many of the territories that were formerly uh, under the control of various uh, European colon uh, colonial powers, and I should say that it, not only the Europeans had colonies, the Asians had colonies as well, the Japanese had colonies. Uh, you, when you freed yourself and you determined that you have your own state, then of course you have uh, uh, national freedom. But what is happening with some of the problems that we're talking about needs us to revisit this national freedoms question. If we didn't have to worry about it for a long time, right? so long as your neighbour doesn't have designs on invading your country, you don't worry too much about it. But now you worry about it because issues that we are talking about, such as environment, uh, maritime pollution, uh, even safety, right, or water resources, uh, that is something that you have no choice but to think about, about it uh, in national terms and in terms of freedom. Uh, just talk about drinkable water, for example, freedom to, to have water to live, right? Um, well, rivers originate in highlands, they come down from the mountains. Not every, you don't, not every country owns a mountain or a river. And countries who own mountains and rivers can decide that they shut them down, and the guys downstream don't get anything to drink. Right? But you could do that. You could do that because you have national sovereignty. But is this what we should be looking at? And this is where, you know, as Ambassador, Ambassador uh, reminded us, multilateralism, multinational ways of dealing with these problems are something that's, that we have to deal about, think about again. So come back to our friend Robinson Crusoe. Right? The moment you have somebody there, uh, you can't do whatever you like. So let's take this a little bit further. If you have a group of persons, not just one other person, but a group of persons uh, living with you on that island, then everyone's freedom is necessarily compromised. There is no longer an absolute right to freedom because that could impinge on the freedom of somebody else. So if you hope to live harmoniously on that island, and let's transpose that to bigger entities like the state, right? Um, then you might find a way in which you can compromise and you can agree on your basic ground rules as to what freedoms can be enjoyed, what freedoms may necessarily be curtailed, right? So you need to share island's resources, food, water, where's the best place to sleep, where's the best fish, place to fish, and so on. Uh, and so the exercise of freedom impacts the freedoms of others, and if you uh, like I said, you know, uh, expanded to the context of a state, then it gets increasingly complex. And it is complex not just because of numbers, but because of diversity, right? Uh, 
Many, many states in the world today are artificial states. Singapore is a pretty artificial state. If you look at things geographically, Singapore sits within Southeast Asia. It is part of the sort of the Indo-Malay archipelagic world. Uh, so to have a state carved out like that is really quite, quite unusual. There are forces of, of, of history and of politics. Right? Many of the states in South Africa, uh, I, I'm sorry, in Africa are artificial states. I mean, if you look at the political map of Africa, you've got more straight lines than any other map around the world because they were all carved out by the European powers. And it was decided, in fact, after the Second World War, when they, was, when they had the chance to become independent, whether they would keep those boundaries. And the decision was, we would keep those boundaries because to redraw them would be an even bigger headache for everybody. So states are complex, not just because of size. Singapore is not very big, but it's very complex because of the diversity that you find. That people may not necessarily share the same values that you have, or your spouse, or you grew up with, or socialize in. And that's why uh, you have to rethink how you're going to negotiate that space and the freedom that can be exercised within it. Right? As, as the American political or legal philosopher uh, Wesley Newcomb Hofield uh, suggested a long time ago, that when you look at a right, rights exist because there is always a corresponding duty to observe that right, on the other hand. So if I have a claim of rights, in other words, if I say I have a right to free speech, then somebody has to honour that right. Somebody has to make sure uh, they listen or they give you the space for that right. Uh, otherwise, uh, that can no, not constitute a, a, a right at all. So how do we negotiate this? Now, when we as individuals make assertions or claims of rights, theoretically we can assert our claims to freedoms and liberties against anyone who may possibly infringe them and the law will allow for such assertions or claims. So we can assert rights and freedoms both across a horizontal as well as a vertical claim uh, of plane. Now let's take a look at horizontal claims. I can claim a, a right of freedom over somebody else, another individual, another entity such as a corporation, a company, and so on. Uh, Whereas I can also make a vertical claim, and that's usually made as against a public authority or a state, okay? because it's much bigger than the individual. So insofar as horizontal claims are concerned, our various freedoms such as freedom to make contracts, enjoy quiet enjoyment of our property without people blasting music in the middle of the night, uh, the right to a freedom of a good reputation, these are all secured by laws that allow for remedies for breaches of these kinds of freedoms. Right? These are private law rights, what we call private law rights. Uh, and uh, th that's not really the kind of con con freedoms that uh, we are concerned with. We are much more concerned with the vertical claims against public authorities and the states. So we live in a world of states. This cannot be changed. Maybe it can, but maybe not in our lifetime. And when you live in this kind of a world with states where all of which provide a territorial context in which we enjoy our freedoms, then we need to first look at that context. So in that respect, uh, if you say, well, let's place freedom first, I say, no, you need to place context first because uh, freedom, you need to adjust to the context. You can't run away from, from the fact that you lived in a state. This state happens to be Singapore in our, in our instance. It could be Switzerland in another con context, but you live in that particular context. So there's a territorial context in which your freedoms may be exercised. Now, our claims to freedom are usually facilitated by laws that guarantee these freedoms as against the state. Uh, and why is it against the state? Well, the state, of course, possesses the greatest coercive powers. They have the powers of police and of surveillance and, of, or, or, and, and, and the command of huge resources that could jeopardize individual freedoms and liberties. So these are such a good claims. Now, uh, throughout history, uh, claims uh, of freedom against the state uh, have existed. They've existed for a very, very long time. Did not start with the Renaissance. It started much earlier because so long as you have an oppressive monarch or a, a government, uh, individuals will clamor for some kind of freedom, right? Freedom not to be slaves, for example. This has gone on for thousands of years. 
Now, of course, uh, uh, what has happened in modern times is that they've become reduced uh, into a uh, codified manner by way of law. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have heard of the Magna Carta Liberatum, or the Magna Carta for short. Uh, it's really not about individual human rights, uh, if you actually study the Magna Carta in the context in which it was made. But it was a, a, a bargain which disgruntled barons uh, forced on King John I of, of England and made him promise that he would not imprison them illegally, tax them illegally, uh, ensured them that uh, if there was any break, uh, 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 infraction of the law, it, the swift justice will prevail, and so on. But of course, later on, right, the idea that you put it down in some kind of a charter, Magna Carta means the Great Charter, right, uh, then permeates time and and and. and and by 1689, at least in England, since I'm talking about the Magna Carta, the British Parliament passed a law which came to be popularly known as the Bill of Rights. So it's a long title, it's actually an act declaring rights and liberties of the subject and settling succession of the crown. So finally, law talks about individuals rather than just of parents. Um, and among other things, the Bill of Rights asserted certain ancient rights and liberties guaranteed individuals the right to petition the king, the right to free election of members of parliament, free speech in parliament proceedings, outlawing of excessive fines and punishments, and outlawing cruel and unusual punishments. So you begin to see the building up of specific ideas of what individual freedoms are about. And this model later became the model for the uh, founding fathers of America, where in 1787 they enacted the American Constitution, still the oldest constitution in the world and the most copied. Uh, and the first ten amendments right, were their so-called Bill of Rights. So the idea that you want to put into a legal document, hopefully the highest legal document in your constitution, these rights uh, became very fashionable. right? Uh, and it was copied all over the world. So after the Second World War, rights and freedoms became a major preoccupation of many, many states, especially those who were seeking self-determination, and of the United Nations. And that was why in the United, uh, United Nations Charter, human rights was mentioned seven times. They established the Human Rights Commission, headed by uh, uh, no less than Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of Franklin Roosevelt, the American president, who in a very influential 1941 State of the Union address talked about four freedoms that, that should exist everywhere. He said, in the future days, which we seek to make secure, we look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. Second is freedoms of every person to worship God in his own way, everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear, anywhere in the world. That is no vision of a distant millennium. It is a definite basis for a kind of world attainable in our own time and generation. That was the vision of Roosevelt in 1941. And this was taken seriously by his widow, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, when she took uh, charge of the Human Rights Commission, which drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He talked about four essential freedoms, but if you look at the Universal Declaration, there are about 29 in there. Not every one of them made its way into individual countries' constitutions, right? Uh, because of various reasons. But these were aspirational ideas about what freedom could mean in this world. And it was meant as a charter, not just uh, in, in local constitutions where you make claims against your government, but as an international document uh, that is universal. And that's why uh, originally they wanted to call it a human rights charter, and finally they call it the universal declaration. In other words, it was applied everywhere across the world on the basis that human beings were all born free and equal. This first article, by the way. Right. Um, so, uh, with the proliferation of these guarantees of rights in international human rights documents, um, the fact that they, they also include both positive and negative rights, uh, some rights are, of course, much easier to, ob to observe than others, uh, especially for states. Uh, 
if you are asking for a negative liberty, uh, it's much easier. In other words, it doesn't cost the state very much not to arbitrarily arrest somebody. It doesn't cost the state very much not to impose uh, uh, limitations on speech. But it does cost the state, the state a lot of money if it was going to guarantee that you have a right to work, for example, right to employment, or a right to a decent living, a standard of living. Right? You have a right to an education. That costs money, by the way. And many of you here uh, and us, we're all beneficiaries of the Singapore education system. It costs money. The state has to put money in it to make sure that there are schools, there are teachers, and there are facilities such as this where you can get your education. So let me uh, sort of wrap up by just looking at the conditions that I think are absolutely necessary if we are to allow a flourishing of freedoms in each state. We have to bear in mind that freedoms exist within a state context and the idea here is not so much that freedom trumps everything else, that freedom is above all, but that in each of these circumstances we should maximise the amount of freedom that we can to the individual rather than to clamp them down. In other words, it requires the state to be very, very cautious and to be parsimonious as to what they would regard as necessary restrictions on human rights and of freedoms. What are the three conditions that are necessary, I think, for rights and freedoms to flourish? The first is you need order in a state because the context is the state. So you can't have freedoms if there's chaos, if there's no rule of law, where nobody worries about consequences, where you can do whatever you want, and therefore brute force, power, tends to prevail over those who are weaker. Order is first necessary. This is the usual conundrum we ask in law school. Does law come first or, or order comes first? Without doubt, order must come first. Without order, you can't have law. So the second one, of course, I think, is the rule of law. It's not just talking about existence of law, but the belief that law is important, that it applies to all persons, and that all persons are equal before the law. That even governments, no matter how high a station you may have in life, you are also subject to law. And if there's a breakage of the law, you will have to suffer those consequences. The final one is a lot harder. It's trust. How much do you trust those who place restrictions on your behaviour? In Singapore, the level of trust in the government is pretty high, I must say. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote uh, about this. I, I live in an HDB estate in Tampines, and uh, nowadays the MP comes quite often, twice a year the MP comes. <laughs> uh, my MP is Desmond Chu, the mayor. Right? So Desmond comes uh, one day, and, uh, and I, 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 I told him, I said, hey, Desmond, you're, you're putting up a lot of CCTVs in all the, you know, in my lift downstairs, in my car park, and everywhere else, you know. And he said, yeah, 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 I've been getting a lot of complaints about this, you know. I said, oh, you mean people are unhappy with the surveillance? He said, no, no. The trouble is, you're, you're, blo uh, you're getting your TV, CCTVs earlier than the other side. So the other side is complaining to me, hey, why are you discriminating against me? Where are my CCTVs? Now, that tells you a little bit about the context in which you're operating. And the danger of this, of course, is that trust must not be misplaced. It's hard to earn, but it should never be misplaced. And we always have to constantly balance, because if we, we build systems around total trust or total mistrust, and mistrust of the government is very high in countries like the United States, where you think every policeman is going to shoot you, right? They're the bad guys for some reason. Uh, if you craft a legal system and a system of laws based on total trust or total distrust, there is always a danger because well, human beings can turn bad. They can be good, they can also turn bad. So this is the constant juggling and negotiation that we need to uh, uh, bear in mind that we need to, to do. Right? We need to revisit this, um, uh, the concept of freedom uh, more and more. Often. In fact, this morning my wife asked me why is the topic called 
revisited? Hasn't it been visited before? And I said, no, it's been revisited many times and we need to keep revisiting this because change comes about in our society, largely through the way we interact with each other, largely through size, largely through complexity, but fueled on by other things like technology. I have deliberately not touched on the three topics that were uh, uh, highlighted for this symposium because I thought it would be more important for us to have a framework of reference to kind of engage each other as to what kind of freedoms we are talking about. And for that, I look forward to hearing your views and as well as the view of my fellow panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tan, for your very enlightening keynote address. And, you know, Dr. Tan was talking about CCTV surveillance and, of course, you know, the freedom and privacy and all that sort of stuff. And if we take a step back and we think about, um, say, the U.S. after 9-11 and how we trade personal freedom with surveillance and so on and so forth, and I think that's really an interesting anecdote to, to talk about this whole issue of freedom and how we're revisiting it every single time a change in our society occurs. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the time where I now invite Mr. Vishwa Sadasivan, former nominated member of parliament and the CEO of Strategic Most Private Limited, and of course our moderator for today's forum, as well as our esteemed keynote speaker and panelist to come on stage for the panel discussion. Mr. Sadasivan, Dr. Tan, and panelists, please. This is the time when you guys start talking. Okay, that's important because we have just less than an hour if you stick to the time, right? Um, so that means that all our comments have to be kept short and sharp. No long stories, please. And when there are questions, when it's thrown open to the floor, keep to short questions, not speeches, okay? The speeches are over. Now it's for quick comments. Uh, Kevin talked about the three conditions, right, towards the end. You talked about three conditions necessary for freedom. You're talking about order that is necessary. You need the, the rule of law and you also need trust, public trust. Now that's an interesting framework, right? Because you, it, it's a little bit of a, appears to be a contradiction when you say to have freedom, you need control, right? You need control. But that's exactly what it is because if you look at, I mean, the, the concept of freedom was, was actually first promulgated or, or liberty was first promulgated by John Locke, you may know, you know, in the 1600s. And then subsequently, it was brought to light by, by a famous gentleman called J.S. Mill, John Stuart Mill. And in 1859, he talked about, he talked about, I mean, in a nutshell, he talked about personal freedom and public rights, personal liberty and public rights. You know, so, so really, it's all exactly what he said in the context of exercising that freedom in a, in a context of individuals. Interestingly, when you brought up the point about Robinson, um, about Crusoe, right? The fact is today, even if there was no other human being living there and animals living there, that's also freedom. I mean, there are people who make it their lifetime's uh, conviction to fight for animal rights and the rights of vegetation. So it's not just limited to, to human beings but also to coexisting with all the other things around us. Now, so when we talk about, when we talk about freedom and liberty, which I'm, I'm, I'm clarifying, uh, we can use it interchangeably, but as has been suggested, when we say freedom, it normally refers to freedom that is unbridled. That's just that. You can exercise that freedom. But when you talk about liberty, quite often what it means is, you know, the liberty to use it in the context of others and not harming others. Okay. Now, with that understanding, I just want to present two situations for us to think about, real life situations for us to think about before I throw the questions, uh, the question, my first question to the panelists. In 1992, in June of 1992, my wife and I, uh, we, we were in Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C. And we saw, you know, Capitol Hill is a very large ground area. 
right? There were, about, there were tens of thousands of individuals there. And we wondered what's going on. So curious Singaporeans, Kepo, we decided to go in and find out. Then we realized that most of the crowd were black or colored. That made us feel that we belong. And then we continued to go, walk in, <laughs> right? Because we are people of color, you know? So as we walked in, this is daytime, to our shock, there was a cross burning. A cross burning. This is 1992. And there was a hooded gentleman, hooded gentleman, delivering a very powerful speech against blacks, Jews, and others. He was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. This was in 1992, just outside Congress, the building that houses Congress of the USA. And you know what's the biggest irony? There was police protection for them because of the freedom to express themselves. And most of the policemen were black. It's ironies like this that surface in today's world that we have to come to terms with. Whose rights are we talking about? Whose freedoms? Now when you talk about rights and freedoms, another incident, more recent, 7th of January 2015. It happened in Paris. The terrorist massacre of the staff working in the premises of Charlie Hebdo. Remember? They were Al-Qaeda terrorists who went in and massacred, I think, 17 people. 12 people died. What was their reason for massacre? Because Charlie Hebdo would normally put out caricatures, right? Satires. It's a satirical sort of publication. But they felt that they had the freedom to talk about religion, to mock at Prophet Muhammad. It was an exercise of their freedom. And the Al-Qaeda terrorists said, we were also exercising our freedom to retaliate. Of course, we can talk about proportionality and the like. But fundamentally, both were expressing what they consider their rightful freedom. I think it's important for us to take a step back and ask ourselves, what is the basis of these acts or the actions thereof? Who is right and who is wrong? And very importantly, who is the arbiter? And whether that arbiter is always neutral when he's also part of the community. These are basic thoughts that I'd like you to think about as I throw the, my first question to the panel. So my first question is this, gentlemen. And we have a young man here. And by the way, you know what his name is? It's Tommy Ko. Okay, can we give him a big hand for a very good choice of name? I think his name is aspirational. <laughs> well, well, I must say you're on the right track. You're on the right trajectory to actually get to that Tommy Ko standing. The other Tommy Ko standing. Okay, very big shoes. Um, Okay, I guess you know, you, you know uh, that's Danny. Danny Kwa is the dean of the school, Lee Kuan Yew School of uh, Public Policy. Give him a hand, please. <laughs> Tommy Ko is, uh, is a friend of St. Gallant. He's been there for many years. Uh, he's been invited back again and again because he's supposed to be good at what he does. Uh, there's supposed to be solid grey substance between his ears, so we'll, we'll, we'll find out soon, okay? okay? Uh, you may perform well in St. Gallen, but here maybe not, huh? Okay. And then, anyway, the, the, his main reason for being here is, is that he doesn't have the kind of grey hair that some of us have. 
Okay, talking about grey hair. This man, for some reason, doesn't have grey hair. I get a, a, I guess an SPH, you don't go through too much of stress. Okay. <laughs> he says something wrong with my eyes. Compare this guy and them. Okay. Okay. Uh, Warren Fernandez uh, is uh, editor-in-chief with uh, Singapore Press Holdings. He's also the editor of Straits Times. Okay. Good and this is, of course, my good friend from school. Believe it or not, I know he doesn't look it. He's two years younger than I. <laughs> we went to school together. Okay, my question to you. Right? Freedom. Freedom is very much, the exercise of freedom especially, is very much like having an extremely sharp knife without a handle. Have any one of you used it before? An extremely sharp knife without a handle. If you want to use it, if you want to express it, there's a very high chance that you'll cut yourself. Now that's how I see freedom. And if that's the only knife available, then you use it. So my question here to the panelists is, how do we use this freedom when it's literally double-edged? How do you use this freedom so that the net result is more positive? Let's start with Tommy. All right, good morning everyone. It's great to be here. So, with freedom being a double-edged knife, I think one thing that came to mind immediately is how we can pick up that knife. And I think preparation or our ability to come to a situation in a particular mental mode or a particular frame of mind is helpful. So I was thinking last evening about PMDs because I was walking home at midnight and someone scooted you by express, me. You want to explain what PMDs oh, is? So for, for those in the audience who are unfamiliar, PMDs are personal mobility devices. They're those little e-scooters that as of the 1st of January are now no longer allowed anywhere but park connectors. Correct me if I'm wrong. So. Someone was scooting by me on an e-scooter, and I was like, oh, that's illegal. But I had a pretty good day, and there was otherwise no one else on the sidewalk. So I was like, you know what, I'll let it go. I don't have to open the LTA app to report him or anything like that. <laughs> right? So I think how we approach situations where freedoms collide matter. Because my freedom is not your freedom. As a pedestrian, I might get knocked down by a PMD or a scooter, while on the flip side, you as a scooter rider might want to ride your scooter, and we need to share a space. So even as we try and expand the amount of space that is available so that people can coexist peacefully and harmoniously, it's helpful to keep in mind that each of us enters these situations with some sort of tolerance battery. Right? If I was having a bad day, if this was the third e-scooter that almost bumped into me on this fateful evening, I would be much less disposed to tolerance, to being able to grant the person his or her freedoms in that situation and in that moment. So in picking up that knife, perhaps the glove that we need to put on in order to ensure that we can use this knife and wield this knife effectively is the glove of tolerance and the glove of being able to identify what is it in, an, in ourselves that allows us to approach a situation in a way where we are not frustrated, we are not otherwise worried about something. I think that's a broader conversation about how we can ensure that as individuals, as societies, as countries, as um, Kevin put it earlier, we can be tolerant. Thank you, thank you. So tolerance is what you would have done. You would have, you would have tried to advocate in a situation like this when there are conflicting ways in which people are expressing their freedom. Yes, but the uh, ability to enter a situation with tolerance is contingent on factors that are not specific to that situation. Yeah. yeah. So incidentally, the Singapore government's approach to it was to ban the PMDs, right? No, which is, which is one approach, which is one approach, uh, but, you know, there are people who argue perhaps there would have been, there could have been another approach. But you have the situation where people were getting injured, you know? So it is, it is very complex and you can't wait for tolerance to set in before you act on it because the other people's freedom to live was being challenged. 
right? Danny, what's your view? Thank you. Thank you, Warren. Um, I really like the image of the double-edged knife that you've constructed for us. But I'd also like to uh, flesh in some of the surrounding images on it. The idea that an individual has the freedom to manipulate that uh, double-edged knife in a useful way, in a gainful way, a way that doesn't harm others around her, presumes that this is an individual that lives in a society, that lives in an environment, that gives her control over her own destiny. That she has to have at least that control. That moreover, this environment that she lives in is sufficiently prosperous that even if it's nighttime, she can light up the room around her, that, that she does not accidentally wield the knife in a harmful way. And for me, these, the issue of an economic background that allows us to wield, that allows us the prosperity, the security, the stability to exercise that freedom is really quite critical. That economic background, it seems to me, is something that often we take too easily for granted. And that we take this for granted and we are too free to dispose of it. So when I think about these great paradoxes that you know, all the keynote speech and you yourself and, and the different conversations have thrown up, for me, the great paradox in freedom today that's emerging is how so much of the world has been able to benefit from institutions that have given them the freedom to gain economic prosperity and they're willing to throw it all away. Yeah. They take this, this economic prosperity so much for granted, they're willing to throw it away. And let me, let me just finish my, th this answer to your question by illustrating what that means. For me, the counterpart as an economist to rule of law are three grand institutions. Globalization, the liberal economic system, the marketplace, and a multilateral world order. All three of these are institutions that provide a level playing field that everybody has a voice, is able to exercise that two-edged knife. And we, human society, have grown so careless with this. We're willing to throw it away. We're willing to throw it away in the name of rising nationalist populism. Rising nationalist populism around the world, paradoxically, the freedom for us to choose our political leaders have led so many societies around the world in the democratic West to choose strongman leaders who threaten the basis for those freedoms, who threaten these institutions, who threaten the World Trade Organization, threaten the multilateral system, threaten globalization. And for me, the, this, this deep paradox, humanity in the 21st century is like we're standing on the edge of a cliff. We're forgetting that what's lit up the room around us, what's given us control of our destiny, so that we can exercise these individual freedoms, we are at risk of throwing it all away in the name of making my country great again. And it seems to me that's a hugely important juncture that all of us who value individual freedoms, who value the economic prosperity that allows us to exercise that, needs to pull up and say, hang on a second, let's push back against this rise of a movement that's undermining the great institutions in the world, that's given us so much in terms of economic prosperity. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Uh, economics, very, very important survival. But the, the important thing to understand also is that economics is also double-edged, right? You have the haves and the have-nots. And the reason why some, I believe, why some of the phenomena that you are talking about is happening is because uh, of the inequalities that are emerging around the world. And the people who are willing to, to destabilize 
or have destabilization as a consequence, as an acceptable consequence, are those who feel, rightly or wrongly, that they've had the short end of the stick for a long time. No? The good thing about economics is those who have will continue to want status quo. Right? A quick response to that. Excellent observation. We feel, humanity feels doubly let down. The same institutions that promised us all equal voice yeah. in achieving prosperity and advancing our, benef our, our well-being seems to have let us down. These institutions have been captured so that globalization now seems to advantage only the wealthy. The liberal economic system seems to make the top 1% even richer. The multilateral system countries claim no longer works for them. So that's the great paradox, that's a great insecurity in us. But we will not fix this by becoming less free as societies. We need to fix this by becoming freer as societies. Well, that's also because part of the problem is that we assume rational behavior, right? And that assumption is not very rational. Well, <laughs> yeah. No, we'll, we'll hold the thought, right? We'll I, come back to you. I believe in the milk of human kindness and, you know, the aspirations in all of humanity. And if you want to call that rationality, you know, and that's something that we want to dispute, that can be debated. But I think people, I give people the idea that they know what's best for them. Otherwise, I wouldn't have given them that two-edged knife called freedom in the first place. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Warren. Thank you, Bishwa. Lots of thoughts running through my mind, but let me start with that double-edged sword. I mean, the sword gives you that power to wield against others, but with it comes, I think, the responsibility to know when not to wield it, because the other person could also wield it against you. So that idea of freedom carrying responsibilities, the context, the culture in which you are going to use it, I think was something Kevin touched upon. You mentioned the Charlie Hebdo uh, incident, and that was something very close to us in the newsroom because they went in and they shot editors and journalists. So in, it was a huge issue for us, and we stepped out our security. We debated, would we have ever run those cartoons? And it was very clear in our minds, we would never run those cartoons because of the context in which we live in, the multiracial, multireligious, multicultural context in which we live in, and we recognize the responsibility we have in wielding that power not to upset the context in which we have been able to enjoy that, that freedom. So I think rightly so that the idea of the cultural context and wielding freedoms with that sense of responsibility. Uh, Danny talked about the importance of the economic underpinnings that, that make freedom, the exercise of freedom possible. Let me just touch on that briefly. Um, I'm part of the World Editors Forum and obviously as a body we, we champion the rights of uh, news organisations to publish freely. But at the same time, we also talk about media sustainability and media innovation. And I always say that all three of them are equal sides of an equilateral triangle. You cannot be free if the media faces, faces commercial pressures from governments, from advertisers, from businesses to constrain what it publishes. You cannot be free if the media is not innovating to stay ahead of technology, to continue to serve its readers so that it's relevant and therefore is sustainable for the long haul. So freedom is not abstract, freedom has to be real and you have to have the economic underpinning to exercise that freedom. So that leads me to the, the question about these issues we are grappling with. Freedom is not the sort of easy answer to many of our challenges. It has all those complexities that come with it. The exercise of power, the exercise of context, my rights against yours, going back to J.S. Mill, self and other regarding rights. So it seems to me the, the, the challenges that Danny points to where we have sort of given up the, the basic underlying principles that led to freedoms, the premises that led to freedoms. Um, freedom has been sort of simplified to this simplistic idea that it's a free for all, each man for himself. Um, go for the bottom line, go for the short term profit. Whereas that was never the understanding of freedom. It was always about freedom to exercise for the public good. You go back to the ancient Greeks, when they talk about freedom of, of speech, you had phaeria, which was about the, the right to speak your mind and speak truth to power and speak freely. 
but it was always to be exercised in the context of speaking for the public good. They had the concept of isigoria, which was the equality of every view. So in this room, each of us had the right to speak up and express a view and hold a view. That equality of view was dependent, though, on us having a responsibility to have a considered view and not just be entitled to your own opinions regardless of the facts. We can't have a debate like this if we can't agree on the facts. We may be entitled to our own opinions, but we are not entitled to our own facts. We, are not, we don't have a right to be ignorant if you want to vote. If you want to vote, you have to be informed. And if you want to be informed, you have to seek out information. You can't just wait for an algorithm to serve you that information. And then we get into all those information bubbles that society is getting into. If you want to have good information, you will have to have good information providers, reliable ones, trustworthy ones. And then you've got to make sure those organizations are sustainable. And here I will make a shameless plug for good media organizations being well financed. <laughs> You'll forgive me for that. But it comes down to that basic idea when we talk about freedom being revisited or freedom being reimagined. I think it's more a matter of freedom being rediscovered and us understanding the rich complexities that underpin that whole idea of freedom. Freedom is not anarchy. Freedom is not laissez-faire. Freedom is about us exercising or wielding that knife with responsibility. Thank you. Uh, I must say, I noticed when you were speaking that quite a few people were doing this. Right. So we'll, we'll come to you because, because some of the things he said are, are definitely controversial, you know, because uh, there, there are questions about access to information and issues such as that. You know, so those could be issues on your, in your mind, but by all means later, when we throw it open to the floor, raise those questions. Uh, and, and I'm sure our panelists, not just Warren, but the others will be happy to, to share their perspectives. Kevin, you want to add anything? No, I think I'd like to hear from you. Okay. All right. One, one, more, one more very quick. I just want a quick comment from you all, the panel, on this, right? Hong Kong. Let, let's go to something more recent. Uh, there have been several commentators who argued that when we talk about freedom, quite often, quite often, it is elitist. It is the intellectual elite who then push the agenda so hard and quite often those who are not your elite end up being cannon fodder for a cause that really is of concern to the intellectuals. I'm not saying this is something I agree with, but these arguments have been put forth. Right? That the, 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 the common man, the common, so to speak, they don't have the bandwidth to think about things like freedom because it's too esoteric when they are concerned about putting food on the table. So what then makes, you know, large numbers of individuals in a place like Hong Kong to do things, to protest for almost a year which results, they know very well, it resulted in destabilization of a very, very successful economy. You know what I'm saying? So what makes people do that? And who is behind it? Is it a universal reflex? Or is it just those who have setting the agenda for those who don't? Quick comment, maybe start with, uh, start with you. Me. Kevin. <laughs> okay, quick comment, huh? quick comment. Not possible. <laughs> Hong Kong is complex. Oh, I thought you said quick comment, not possible. Yeah, no, 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 no. That, that's right. It's not possible to give it quick because Hong Kong is extremely complex. But I think, I think what happens in Hong Kong, without going too much into this, is that freedom becomes a banner under which you, you throw a lot of other things. Unhappiness with the government is one of them. Unhappiness with China is another one of them. Uh, the lack of a future for the young people is another one of them. So there's a whole lot of things that get thrown under the banner of freedom. It's not so much about freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Tommy. So, quick thought. I think freedom today is not the same as freedom tomorrow. 
and sometimes in the actions that are performed today or the efforts that are put in today in order to secure a future, that's something that's necessary, right? That's why the environmentalists are all telling us to fly less or to be more conscious about our carbon emissions. But at the same time, I think the question which is a more broad-based question than just an elite question, is whether or not the sacrifices we're making today are worth it. What is the end game? Is that end game something that people can buy into? And my answer to that for Hong Kong is, no, I don't think so. I don't think so what? So I don't think that end game is clear. And I don't think the end game is something that people can buy into. Right? Because they are trying, there is a deep effort to defend freedom today in an effort to secure freedoms of tomorrow. And I think that sacrifice is something that we all individually accept, right? We accept it for all the meals in the room and our commitment to national service, where we need to give up some of our freedoms today in order to secure things like sovereignty in the future. So there are these commitments that we make, but whether or not that is worth it and whether or not there is a large, broad-based, legitimate belief in it being worth it, I don't think Hong Kong has that. Okay, Tommy, I've got to ask you this. You're the only young person on the panel. Okay. Yeah? Okay, okay, okay. Young at heart doesn't count. Okay? And believing you're young at heart is even worse. Okay, so my, my, my question to you is this. If you were in Hong Kong and you were a, a member, a legitimate member of the Hong Kong community, would you have taken to the streets? I would not. Okay, why not? Because you're a Singaporean? <laughs> Actually, for, for what it's worth, yes, right? Because my, my frameworks and my ideologies are very much contextual. But I wouldn't have taken to the streets because taking to the streets, while it was an acknowledgement of the erosion of trust, rule of law, and order, would not make any of those three things better. Because I do not see an endgame in which Hong Kong can emerge from its chaos in a way that is constructive and that helps it rebuild. Okay. Okay, La Ken, give him a hand, give him a hand. <laughs> also, there are many other young people in the crowd, so we should definitely hear your thoughts. He's, he's also being, I guess, cautious because he's, he's doing his national service now. <laughs> <laughs> and um, those may not be sprinklers. Yes. <laughs> you might have his freedom reimagined. <laughs> yes, Warren. No, a quick answer. I don't think it's entirely economic in Hong Kong. I think it's about hope. Yeah. It's about young people not having that sense of hope, and it's about trust, as, as uh, Kevin rightly pointed out. It's trust in whether the system, the leaders, will give me that sense of hope unless I come out on the streets. Thank you. Let me go out on a limb. But first, let me qualify this. I agree with what has already been said about Hong Kong. But let me go out on a limb and suggest something else. Um, you began by saying, well, there's this discussion about freedom, is it a rich society concern in Hong Kong? So suppose I pretend I am an, a space traveling alien and I've landed on our planet and I go look around societies and I look at Hong Kong and I say there's all this civil turmoil, protests in the streets, do I find it puzzling? I would say when I see all this happening, I also see one of the most unequal, socially immobile societies in the world. I see young people having to save for a century before they can buy even minimal housing. I see high school graduates coming out of Hong Kong universities who cannot get a job, no job at even low wages. I see intense competition for resources from the large societies around them, including China. And I would, without even having to look, read a headline, about freedom, democracy, rights, I would say Hong Kong, completely understandable. This is what's going on. So if we strip away sort of all the other, all the other cosmetic attached to it, all of which are important, but at fundamentals, it is economics and the inequality that's been allowed to emerge in Hong Kong that's driving such political agitation. Thank you, thank you. All right, we are ready. Come on. Put up your hands. Okay, first gentleman. Uh, you'll have to come to the mic. Actually, to save time, the others could walk to the mic if you have a question as well. Especially if you walk as slow as this gentleman. <laughs> hey, young man, can you please trot faster? Okay. 
So your name, your IC number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So name is Tsing Rong. Uh, I, yeah, that's my name. And so we can call you Rong. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So am I right? No. <laughs> oh, that's so corny, my God. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, like I feel like great discussion today by the speakers and the panelists. And we have actually talked about different types of freedom today uh, in terms of how it's contextualized, how it's defined. Uh, Dr. Kevin talked about like the different individual freedom, societal freedom, political freedom. And the level, level of freedom today, like it has been changing over the years, right? From back in the Egyptian days and uh, Tommy rightfully mentioned that uh, freedom from today is kind of different from the freedom of tomorrow as well. So two questions. Right. First is, as we step into this new decade, what type of freedom do you think will take center stage? And second would be, where there's different types of freedom, we have talked about the different types of freedom, do you feel that there will be a, there will be a world, there will be a time where this type of freedoms will be able to coexist equally, and if so, what are some of the key conditions for that to happen? Okay, quite, quite heavy, huh? Okay, <laughs> all right, anyone on the panel? Wants to go first? <laughs> you see, you've stumped the, the panelists. Yes, Danny. I'll go. I mean, there's a, as you ask your question, part of me wants to be very optimistic and says, you know, these are the, the freedoms that we will need to be thinking about going forward. The, the freedom of humanity in, in engaging with AI, the freedom to use, leverage ever better technology, the role of robots. Uh, freedoms in the context of global climate change that eventually liberate the human spirit. I want to think all that. But then there's a side of me that's extremely pessimistic. And I say humanity needs to really recalibrate its priorities. It needs to step back from the brink of geopolitical conflict. And the freedoms that will emerge from that are large uh, th those forces are large ones that individual freedoms will need to situate themselves. We're not handling global climate change well at all. Okay, let me join the chorus of 16-year-old Swedish schoolgirls uh, saying that we've done a terrible job of managing global climate change. Australia is burning as we speak. It's burning chunks of tra tracts of territory that dwarf everything that we've seen happen elsewhere. Uh, the largest cyclones, the largest floods have hit so many different parts of South Asia. So the freedoms that we will need to be thinking about will be ones that are hugely constrained by trying to navigate an ever more dangerous world. Uh, so that for about 5, 10, 15 years we're going to have to deal with that. That would be my answer. It's a rather pessimistic answer. But that's how I see things. Thank you. Can I just jump in? I think it's not so much which kinds of freedoms that we will have to sort of grapple with. It's a question, for me, it's more a question of how we will exercise those freedoms and in what context. How we would balance those competing freedoms. So whether you take climate change, do we have a right to pollute for today as opposed for the impact on the future generations? How do you balance those two, two freedoms? Do you have a right to pollute just because you're rich and therefore can pay for it? Again, you're, you're, it's a balance of competing freedoms. Um, so it's about understanding the societal context in which those freedoms arise. Just because you have the, the right to, to set up a business doesn't mean you have a right to sort of rape and pillage the earth. Doesn't mean you need to necessarily be that 1% that owns everything and accrues all the profits. How do you ensure that you are exercising those freedoms in a way that benefits the rest of the society as well. So I, I think going forward, whether it's the economic challenge, the climate change challenge, the challenge between rising powers and diminishing powers, it goes back to what, is those, what are those freedoms for and how do you exercise it in a way that achieves the greatest good for the greatest number, which goes back to J.S. Mill. If, if I could just give, I know I'm moderator, but uh, give my view. I think for this decade and probably beyond, there would be a contestation of basic rights to privacy because of the fourth industrial revolution, because of everything that is changing in the technological world that we live in. 
I think there's going to be a pull and push about this because nobody has the answer where, where we should be. You know what I'm saying? Technology, the te technology clock is moving probably five times faster than the policy clock. Policy clock is always playing catch up. And people are beginning to, people want to leverage on technology. They don't want to be left behind. At the same time, they're terrified about everything that they do being watched. Right? So, so I think that would be a major contestation about rights and freedom for the next decade. Any other comments? Just a quick one. I rolled the two questions into one because actually uh, you've got to look at the context in which you're asking that question, right? So you're saying in 21st century or in this new decade, what, what is going to be most pressing? Uh, which freedom would be most pressing. And in that respect, if you're talking about the case of Singapore and countries like Singapore, I think uh, what you're talking about is absolutely uh, crucial. I think uh, uh, privacy rights, and there is no right to privacy, by the way, under the constitution. So this is, uh, you know, this is something that we may need to relook uh, in, in, in that respect. But um, yeah, I, I think I'll leave it there. And a quick two sentences. I think you asked whether freedoms can coexist equally, and I think the answer to that is no, right? Because if you think about the context in which freedom exists, the contestations in which freedom needs to be negotiated, there are times where one freedom might be prioritized. There are times where, as Biswa pointed out in the East Kuda or PMD um, saga, where people die and those freedoms need to be curtailed. So I think we need to get rid of the notion that these things can coexist equally, but rather be comfortable talking about how there's contestation, how there are trade-offs, and how freedom is definitely a question of opportunity cost in any situation. Thank you. Zainal uh, first. Yep. Any other, any other questions? Yeah. OK, please stand by. Thank you, uh, Viswa. I must say that I'm very inspired. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I mean, you inspiring me and others is not new. But uh, Tommy, really <laughs> very inspiring. But I won't go into aspirations. Because if I have to go into our Singapore pledge aspirations, it's a different area. <laughs> but um, I just like to pick on your your example of the double-edged knife. When I first heard that, I was glad you didn't say double-edged sword. But Warren went on to say double-edged sword. Because double-edged sword, then you go into Charlie Hebdo and the Abu Qaeda, it's a different meaning again. Yeah. But I like to uh, touch on what uh, Tommy reacted by saying that how do you handle double-edged knife right and the glove is that a way out using a glove does it help but if you look at the word glove the base word is love but with a G in front and how do I interpret G God government and ground rules so I come to my question now about not so much about freedom, but about revisiting. And in the context of Singapore, and my question is, what do you think about Singapore revisiting this idea about freedom? Have we done well or not? We have been making a lot of adjustment, whether it's about multiculturalism, God, about government, understanding the role of government, how we dealt with the communist challenge, racism and ground rules. Have the people responded enough to make sure that it's revisiting the need for revisits about freedom and many other issues critical to our survival is adequate and what more could we do? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, I'm appointing you to represent the panel. <laughs> I have no freedom to object, right? Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, Zainal. I think that's a very uh, important question. It's not one that's not, not been asked a whole lot. And um, a, a quick answer to that is that I think we could do a lot better. We should revisit some of these things a lot better. What has happened, I think, studying the nature of rights in our country in the last 30 years is that we have become increasingly reactive to situations rather than to look at the whole picture. 
we have not had a we had a constitutional commission in 1966 that actually looked into uh, some of these issues. Uh, the last constitutional commission of 2016 doesn't count because that was specifically uh, uh, appointed to look into the elected presidency. And we've never actually looked at this holistically. So what happens now is that you are piecemeal. There's a piecemeal knee-jerk reaction to, by the state, actually, to many of these issues which involve our various freedoms. PMDs, I mean, that's one thing. I mean, Tommy was talking about. I mean, the, the day they came out, uh, you know, I, I mean, I live in an HDB estate. You, you, you think, you know, the first question we were asking, why isn't this being regulated? Where's the license? Where's the insurance? Who are these guys? State is silent. Seems to be the policy. Let's wait and see. At some point, it got so frustrating, people were saying, let's see how many people need to die before they act. And the way it was reacted was very poor. It was not even a, a considered policy rollout on how to deal with PMDs. What do you do? You wait for a parliamentary question to the minister. And for you, those of you who are not very familiar with the parliamentary process, uh, you, you can file questions to the minister and the minister is obliged to reply. Sometimes it's written, sometimes it's oral. And the PMD policy was reversed in response to a parliamentary question. In other words, if you don't ask me, I keep quiet. That strikes me as, well, either poor planning, or a lack of actually overarching perspective of this. Um, there are, of course, other reactions. Uh, you know, we can talk about the Films Act, POFMA. Uh, right now, of course, there's a pending case. It will be very interesting what the court decides. Uh, and the, the, it's always reactive. Oh, we have a problem. Fake news is a big problem. OK, then you roll out something in order to co combat this. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Minister of Law tried very hard to persuade everybody that it's the best thing uh, for Singapore. Uh, I told him that I thought it was unconstitutional and he said, no, no, we don't think, we think otherwise. And then that was the end of the story. Right? Uh, because clearly, if one were to take Article 14 of our Constitution seriously, which is the Freedom of Expression uh, Association and, and uh, Assembly provisions, uh, it doesn't fall within one of the uh, provisions uh, which allow the government to impringe these particular rights. But that's, that doesn't, in other words, there's no revisiting. We are right. It's necessary. Uh, state uh, security and so on prevails over everything else. And I think this is where uh, more revisiting would be very helpful, I think, greater discussions. Thank you. Warren. I think it's a question of that revisiting being an endless process. You, you, when you articulate it, it sounds as though we've arrived at a constant state. I think the, the balance was different when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was the Prime Minister. It changed when Mr. Go Chok Tong became the Prime Minister. Rights versus responsibilities, individuals versus collective. And it changed in the last 10, 10 years or so. And I think it will continue to change with a new set of uh, leaders, with, with a new electorate it will have to be a constant revisiting of that agreement we've come to in a society over how those rights and those responsibilities and those freedoms are exercised. Um, on the question of POFMA, I agree with Kevin that it is now before. Just explain. POFMA is this fake news law that has um, been passed in Singapore. It's now being played out uh, in practice. Uh, it's before the court, so I think we have to be careful what we say or we may all have our freedoms re revisited. Um, but I think if you step back from the law in Singapore, there is a big issue that is being grappled with all around the world. And that is the freedom of information and the freedom to misinform. And the freedom for technology companies to serve up information without telling you what's in that algorithm. Where's the freedom for transparency for me to know how you're choosing to serve that information and withhold other information from me? We don't know. Many of us have asked, but we've not been told. There's an issue of freedom there as well. So to me, this is a challenge that technologically societies have been presented with. 
And POFMA is a symptom of an attempt to deal with it. We may or may not like the, the way we're dealing with it, but societies are going to have to deal with it. I gave views to the select committee um, on the drafting of the, the, the bill, and our position, our views as expressed was, if you're going to do this, please make sure it's applied across the board to all players, not just some, some media and not others. Please make sure it's done in an open and transparent way where you explain why you're doing it. And please make sure it's contestable so that it can be challenged. The government took on board those views and, and, and responded in its own way, and now it's playing out uh, in practice. For us in the, the Singapore media, we've never had a problem operationally with this law because we're not in the habit of deliberately putting out fake news. And if ever we did, by mistake, we would be happy to correct it. So the law as it's, it's been passed is if you run something which is deemed incorrect, you should correct it or you should carry the other side. And that's something I think we've been practicing all along. So. Okay, so uh, I just want to move on because quite, I see quite a few hands. Uh, but, but if I may, yes sir, please. Yes, sorry, because he put up his hand earlier. Uh, while you're walking to the mic, uh, I'd like to also highlight that maybe the word is not revisit but renegotiate. I th my own reading of it is there is going to be a constant renegotiation of rights, freedoms and responsibilities at this point in time and in the next few years. Because I, f I do feel that Singapore is, like many other city-states or many other countries, uh, at a point of, a critical point of inflection. Because there is a critical mass of individuals who have reached a level of affluence and level of exposure through education where the question of rights and freedom have started to take center stage in their hearts and minds. That's my own sense. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Kripalani, Uttam Kripalani from Galaxy Insurance. Uh, can I switch a little bit away from the current discussion we are having? As long uh, as we stick to the topic. It's freedom. Uh, yeah. What more can we do to get freedom from the disastrous effects of weather? and these natural disasters that we are doing. Are we doing enough, for instance, to gather information to divert people from the possible areas of uh, weather-related calamities? Can, is there any way we should look at the freedom aspects of weather? Yeah, so climate change uh, as Professor Daniqua talked about yeah. just now, you know, the, the situation in Australia. These are, these are wake-up calls for us. Yes. But is there, is there any panelists who would like to comment on this? Because the, the answer is, is a resounding yes. I, I, you know, that, that, that there's a new sensibility that's, that's arisen, I believe, that is forcing us to do something about it. But this is one of those things that, that uh, individual freedom or sovereign freedom alone is not going not to do it. It's got to be multilateral. Absolutely. at a multilateral and, level. And I believe the world is not doing as much as we should be doing about this. Well, the, uh, the even, USA can certainly even, do more. Even, even something like the Paris Agreement, uh, USA pulled out of that. Yeah. And without them being in the picture, how far will we succeed in this freedom aspect? Well, there's an Im impeachment process going yeah, on at this I point in time. That. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, please. Your turn. Okay, hi. So good morning and happy 2020. So my name is Jacqueline Cole, Gaha NYAA. So I first witnessed the ideal freedom in Switzerland during the NYAA Singapore Switzerland exchange in 1995. So um, I still truly remember and was amazed with the civic mindedness and freedom of expression endorsed by everyone in that community. The pride, the trust, the love for their community is commendable. So for example, if someone who violate this order and they were to throw a piece of rubbish on the street, this little action will be quickly frowned upon by their fellow community member and then it will be quickly ratified and that person will have to pick up that rubbish. And not just by one person who will frown on this person who violate the order, but a lot of people were frowned upon him. 
So this is the ideal kampong spirit that every society needs to embrace this fundamental value, to know what is right for the larger community, and to take care of one another. So my question is, how do we really communicate this uh, key, how to get this key communication through of the ground rules, especially to have fellow community to catch non-conforming behavior rather than catching through CTTV. Yeah, so how can we foster our ideal kind of uh, kampong village for all of us again? Thank you. I think we should cane people. <laughs> cane them on the streets, whip them, develop new kinds of caning and shame them by webcasting it live. <laughs> Perhaps. I mean, that's my take on it. Sorry. For sure. Suddenly I'm happy you're a former NMP. <laughs> see, that's the reason why I didn't seek a second term as an MP. <laughs> they wouldn't listen to my caning proposition. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Can I just... I think we haven't given the gentleman a good answer to his question on the environment and what we can do. And it kind of relates to the second question as well. I'm with you, I, I don't think we're doing enough to tackle the environmental challenge and the, the, the problem really is because of the complexity of the issue. I mean, you notice here we don't have plastic bottles anymore. We used to have plastic bottles of water. Society has moved beyond that because single-use plastic has become a big issue. But if you go deeper into it, there's a big debate about whether stopping the use of plastic and using alternatives, using bottles and is, is a good option, but using other forms like paper straws and metal straws, not a given that that's necessarily better. The, the, the complexity comes from the need to get the information about the full cycle of the use of the plastic. How many times do you, use, do you need to use that metal straw before it becomes better than the plastic straw? Um, and it's because of that, that difficulty that I, I allude to in the complexity of the issue that makes this a hard issue to grapple with, climate change. Not only do you have complexities of fact, you have complexities about the balance between the present, the future, and to me it goes back to that fundamental issue of the willingness of the population to make sacrifice. If we are really going to deal with this problem of climate change, it will require enormous sacrifice on all our parts. Let's not pretend. It's not going to be Vishwa giving up his right to, to drink water in a plastic bottle. It may be all of us having to do it. Or it may be us having to pay a much higher cost for some of the, the things we, we take for granted today. So it's that, that, that willingness to accept that freedom comes at a certain price. And are we prepared to pay that price that makes this, this issue so difficult to grapple with? Thank you, if I may. Like Warren, I feel these two last questions are connected. So if I may, let me pick up first Jasmine's question about the kampong spirit. How we re-energize our local communities back to this view that it's not just a rat race. It's not just a zero-sum game that somebody else wins and they only win when I lose. That inequality is you know, the, the sharp divider among us. We need to get beyond that. And I think the way that history has found to get beyond that is through clarity of political vision. That we have leaders that stand up. Ronald Reagan, we might, we might say, you know, Ronald Reagan was a cowboy actor who couldn't quite distinguish reality. But what he did for America was he re-inspired America. He said we will again have mourning in America. People will help each other. People will be a community again. In America, they don't know the word kampong, but if they had, this would have been appropriate for them. This gets me to the question about what we can do about global climate change more. And like Warren, I feel that, yes, a big part of the challenge that is so complex, but there's another part of the challenge that's actually very simple. And that simple part is that we have been free riding on the goodwill of so much of the rest of the world. Free riding again entails the word freedom. Well, but what it means is while the world is trying to repair itself, we think that by looking out for ourselves, by being a little bit kiasu, you know, by looking out just for ourselves, we can get away with it. And what we need to do, just like with the kampong spirit, is that we have to get people to stop thinking 
they can get away with it. That by throwing that plastic bottle, by, by being frivolous in the way they use plastic or, or energies, they can get away with it. And we need to rebuild that. And part of the rebuilding that in the global movement on climate change, it's what's called mitigation. It's not, it's not called mitigation, it's called adaptation. Because there are two grand strategies on taking care of global climate change. One is mitigation, to remove carbon from the air. The other is adaptation. How do we redesign our societies, our communities, so that we can still live comfortable lives if the global environment changes drastically? And for that, we're going to need a lot of goodwill from people. We're going to need a lot of kampong spirit re-inspiration. I think that's going to be hugely important going forward. Yeah, and, and uh, a lot of the oil companies, for example, are going through significant transformation to cleaner fuel, cleaner energy. Clean energy transformation is going. But these things don't, can't happen overnight because of the economic impact on people and on, on nations. So that's the reason why it's not as discernible as, as it's what's happening on the ground, right? Uh, quick question. Thank you. Today we are talking about refugees everywhere. So my question is to the panel is that uh, where do we draw the line between the freedom of uh, humans or refugees and hu freedom of citizens? Okay. Great question. Uh, quick comments, anyone? Wow, you stumped I'll, again. <laughs> I'll speak to it, but um, very briefly, I wanted to push back very lightly on, actually, no, I just wanted to push back on the ideal ground rules um, that were brought up in the previous question, because I think we can speak with great passion about nostalgia and about the kampong spirit, right? But who are we to say that the kampong spirit is the right model? Right. Do we believe that the political vision is the kampong spirit or needs to be the kampong spirit? I think that goes back to the crux of the question, how? How are we going to decide what freedoms are and what freedoms need to be preserved? Which goes to the most recent gentleman's question, which is citizens or migrants, citizens or refugees. And I think I would like to answer that question by saying that it's a process of renegotiation that requires the participation of individuals, right? So both citizens of a particular country and also citizens of other countries. But in that process of renegotiation, this is a forum for us to talk about what matters to us. But do the people who believe deeply, for instance, in nationalism or in protectionism, are they at forums like these? And how can we include them in the conversation to ensure that if under Singapore together we are going to have these citizen consultations, that their voices are also heard so that they can buy in to this larger vision, be it political, be it social, or frankly, be it just a community vision of what we should move towards. Thank you. We are, we've actually run out of time, but I am a very kind person, so I will allow two more questions from the two people who are standing up. I'm so sorry, uh, and then we have to wrap soon after that. Yes, please, go ahead. We'll take the two questions together. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Srishti Marva and I'm year one NUS MBA student. Uh, so my question is that we've been talking about uh, political freedom, economic freedom, freedom from disruptive technologies like AI. But uh, when it comes to uh, societal realm of this, for example, uh, different, commu different communities and countries have different rules. For example, for women rights. Uh, so they have different uh, rules and different beliefs. So when we talk about an international forum like St. Gallen, how do we coincide opinions from different communities when it comes to societal realms? Because on environments, on data protection, we can have uh, concurrent opinions, but what about societal realm? And, and cultural differences exactly. as, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you, Mr. Malminda here. Yeah. Uh, I just want to go back to the point also, the analogy of uh, a double-edged uh, sword or knife, which assumes immediately that the opportunities and threats or the pros and cons are uh, equal to all, which is not true, because it's also what's an individual right uh, is not similar to a collective right or collective freedom, right? Uh, and I think Mill also made this distinction between um, freedom and liberty as well. It has to be tempered with um, collective freedom. Yeah. So my point is that we see more of this tension now between individual freedom and collective freedom, uh, the, 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 this, the this, uh, distinction between the two. And in the past, governments perhaps played a greater, a greater role in trying to provide the moral responsibility to equate the two, to ensure that individual freedom was not, did not surpass collective freedom. 
but governments now don't have the, either the ability to do so because of trust deficit or don't want to do so because of populism. So in that space, who will play that role in providing moral responsibility to ensure that individual freedom and collective freedom do not threaten and do not pull apart? Okay, so who, who plays the, the, the arbiter? That's right. Or the, okay, That's right. all right. Okay, any panelists would not take a crack at it first? Let's keep it short. I think I think you uh, you have to un again contextualize the the question. Sometimes the state has no choice. The state cannot always pull back. If the state is so deeply embedded in the entire social structure and economic structure of the state, the state has no choice but to be the mediator to ensure that collective rights and so on. I mean, just take a simple example, HDB flats. 80% of Singaporeans live in HDB flats. The state is involved in this. You can't simply say, oh, okay, HDB don't care. You all do whatever you like. I mean, you know, then individuals can, can, can do whatever they like. You know, put up strange additions to their houses and then irritate their neighbors. You know, keep a lion in the house. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you, you, you can't do that, right? Uh, because, uh, somebody's got to take charge of that. And if the state is so embedded, then no choice. The state has to do the job. Quick question. Is the state to play the role of the mediator or arbiter? Uh, yes, I think it have to. No. Is uh, it mediator or arbiter? Well, they're, too, they're, 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 they're related. They're related, right? If you can't mediate, then you have to arbitrate. You try to mediate first. You can't mediate and you judge. The reason why I'm saying is I think, I think the word mediator is important because the mediator actually works on the power vested in the parties to come to an agreement. Yes. The arbiter actually pushes his power, his authority. No, the arbiter decides on the basis of accepted norms. Right. Okay. Can All I right. jump in? This is it's actually a real life issue. I mean, one of the best read stories in Straits Times over the last week or two was precisely this, an individual having to put up with an intolerable din from his neighbours, tries to get it mediated, goes to various authorities, town council, housing board, and nobody could deal with it. So he goes to the commission, the council for domestic dispute resolution, and he gets an injunction, he pastes it on the neighbour's door saying, you have to leave. The neighbours say, well, nobody is going to adjudicate or apply this law, so I'm not going to leave. Then, the law ministry has to come out and say, excuse me, this is a court order, and on sanction of the law, you will abide. So that's where the state had to, to intervene. So I think the questions are genuine, and these are very real issues playing out in the world in seemingly small ways, where we're having to have this contest of freedoms, and learning that freedoms comes with that double-edged knife or double-edged sword. But you go to the other end of the spectrum, climate change, the burning forests, you know, pollution. That's the same contest of ideas, but played out on a planetary level. And I think going forward, we're going to have that renegotiation as you speak, played out over and over again in more and more complex issues. Now, what about the lady's question about, you know, cultural context? Anyone wants to comment on it? Yes, please. Thanks. The Short one, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be very short. I can't yeah. hear myself. <laughs> <laughs> Is it on? Warren, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Now, the, this one's a question about social or national sensibilities, cultural differences. And I, uh, how, what do we do when they come into conflict or when they differ? I think that there are, there are, there are, there are two strands to an answer here. Typically, when cultural sensibilities differ, they don't necessarily conflict with one another. And it's then incumbent upon the group, the community, to look for the commonality, to look for the best of each of these different diverging sensibilities and take forwards the shared understanding. I think that's how humanity has always behaved. It is very rare. Humans are not miserable people. They don't go out and say, what I want is exactly what you must not be able to have. They don't think about things in a zero-sum game. And what we need to do is to constantly look 
for the commonality that's, that's in humanity across the different strands of society. And that is why it's actually a very rational way to think about things. Economists are actually very rational about these things. We're not miserable people. <laughs> that, it seems to me... Let's have beer. <laughs> it, it, it is the way forward. If I may, a last word yes, on the, the other question. Um, and this was a question about what happens when individual freedoms within a society come into conflict with, with group understandings. Yes. Uh, who arbitrates, and we've got some very excellent answers already in specific circumstances. But there's a more general question here. What is going on in the world that individual freedoms are being used to infringe on our fellow humanity? What is going on when, when democratic majorities end up putting in place democratically elected institutions and strongman leaderships that then end up disadvantaging the rest of humanity. That's something very fundamental and extremely dangerous. We, humanity, have been able to get through the last seven million years navigating this treacherous landscape. And the danger is, because of inequality or perception or fake news, we have reached an impasse where so much of our fellow citizens feel that it's now okay to stomp on the rights of others, yes. whether it's of refugees, or our fellow citizens because they are different from us. We need to pull back from that. We need to use freedoms to pull back from that. Yeah. Okay. I, think, I think it was Farid Zakaria, right, who, uh, CNN, who talked about, who, who, who actually talked about this phenomenon. Democratically elected individuals who then go on to reign with, in, with tyr tyranny, right? Uh, and and uh, he, I think he, he, he called it, or somebody else called it, uh, illiberal democracies. Right. Now, so these things happen. Now, I'd, I'd like to end this discussion by presenting uh, a perspective by a very large country, China, of how to handle freedom. It's a very, very novel way of handling it. You may have heard of it. Some of you may have heard of it. It's called China's social credit system. It's going to be made nationwide by the end of this year. This is how it works, right? Uh, 500 million people, at least, are going to be affected by this through the use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, online databases, smartphones, the system will closely watch every move of every citizen of the country. And it will be collected in a database. Now every citizen will receive, numeric, will, 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 will receive a, num, a numeric index between 600 and 1,300 uh, 1, based on their trustworthiness and virtue index. This is real, guys, okay? This index will determine whether you have, the individual has better access or no access to certain public services, privileges, and freedom. So you're, you're measured and you'll be given a place in the index, right? In 2018, the Ministry of Transport, uh, Ministry of Tour Tourism in China said that there have been 20 million instances where individuals, because of the poor scoring on the index, have been denied air and road travel. Now, this is China's way of creating a more virtue-based society. And you know what's the, what's the best part of it? The people of China, by and large, support it. Because they are very tired of their, their, they trust the government more than their fellow Chinese who they feel are barbaric. Now this, this is all documented. This is going to happen. And the reason why I'm highlighting this and right at the tail end of it and coming in the, in the wake of your question is there are different societies that have chosen to define freedom and preserve that freedom in a very free way the way they see it. And who's to judge? Okay. I'd like this to be the, the point on which I'd like the final comment from each of the panelists. And please, can we keep it to one minute? Right. Let's start with Danny. Danny. Oh, sorry, sorry, Tommy. Uh, okay. you, 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 know, <laughs> you see, it's called aging. <laughs> and on the note of freedom, and as a closing comment, I think the 
at the end of the day on the social credit system and whether or not people in China believe it to be a legitimate system, it goes back to the question of context and it goes back to the question of how we decide what freedoms we want to uphold as a society. And as a closing thought, I think those platforms and the mechanisms in which we find and identify ways not just to have conversations amongst people like us, but the people who are disenfranchised, people who are bitter, who are frustrated, who are upset, and who frankly wouldn't volunteer or actively seek out platforms to share their views. I think that's going to be fundamentally important. It's the noisy neighbor who, after getting evicted, is really, really upset about the rule of law and frankly can't stand it anymore, who we need to engage. And I think we all need to think very deeply about how these people can be given platforms so that we don't create a society that merely sharpens the divides between us versus them because that becomes dangerous and that becomes a problem. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah, I, I don't think I have very much more to add than what has been said so far. Um, but I think we, we need to have, uh, and I agree with Tommy here, that we need more, more engagements, more dialogue and a more inclusive um, dialogue on uh, different ways in which we're looking at the concept of freedom in each society. Thanks. Thank you. I would say the scenario you've painted to me is a nightmare scenario because that was what J.S. Mill was talking about when he warned about the tyranny of the majority. And I think although we've talked about context and cultures and, and negotiating between competing freedoms, it's not all just relative. There was one fundamental pr uh, principle which I think he rightly elucid elucidated, which was if you are going to constrain somebody else's freedoms, you better have a very good reason for doing so. Because that freedom is important. It's not to be willed away. So I think we do want to have a system, a situation where we are all free to begin with to, to, on that Robinson Crusoe island. But before you constrain it, there has got to be compelling reason to do so. Thank you. Danny. So, two quick thoughts on the scenario that I described. First, the most vivid illustration I have yet seen of what Viswa described is our free market social media system. Our Facebooks and Twitters and Instagrams and Snapchats. In fact, the Netflix TV series, Black Mirror, illustrated exactly one episode where one individual's life goes to pieces because she made a wrong step and then everybody began to give her social media stream dislikes and she could not get alone her life her life shot to pieces she had no friends she couldn't even go into mcdonald's mcdonald's wouldn't let her in because her social media rating system was insufficiently high the nightmare scenario, I share with Warren this, this distaste for that, is one that is not confined to just the prescribed system that you have described for China. So that gets me to my second very quick concluding point. What China, what you have described for China, there was a key phrase you described there, in that the people there trust their government. In the rest of the world, if we try to build a system like that in the West, if you try to build a system like that in England, where I lived for a quarter of a century, try to build a system like that, the people will be up in arms because they don't trust the government. In China, you've got 1.4 billion people who trust the government, who are going in for an evidence-based public policy approach to dishing out rewards and punishments for anti-social behavior. If you trust the people who are going to run that system, you would give it a thumbs up. But if you don't trust the people, you would give it a dislike. The critical point here is not the technology, it's not the system, it's the trust that people, communities are able to build with one another and with the people who govern them. Thank you. Okay, so here's what it is, the way I see it. My wife and I had a big fight a few, uh, the, the recent one, who said that, who said that? Come here, come here. <laughs> John, okay, we had a rec big fight recently and, um, and I, at the end of the fight I told her, you see how useful this fight is? We've now come to understand each other even better after 40 years, you know. The point I'm making is, I'm such a fraud, right? But, but it works, you know, it works. <laughs> 
I think, regardless of how inconvenient it might be, we need to talk more. The world needs to talk more, but from a point, from a standpoint of not having monopoly on wisdom, of hearing each other out, no matter how, how abstract the other party's, the other party's viewpoint might appear, we should listen to their perspective with an open mind because we are all captive, captives our own consciousness. And I think unless we have that kind of open dialogue, honest dialogue, we are going to be facing calamity in this multilateral world, you know. And that is where we, in, in, in the globalized world, where the world is, is shrinking, we are seeing centrifugal and centripetal forces at play, right? We are seeing nationalism rising as globalization is taking place. So in this messiness, there's no, there are no shortcuts. We've got to talk to each other, even if it means short fights, right? And that's the reason why I'm a great fan of St. Gallen Symposium. Because the St. Gallen Symposium has found, made it into a fine art to come up with interesting, thought-provoking, if not provocative, topics for people around the globe to come together, spend two to three days talking about it robustly. Are there, are there conclusive conclusions? The answer is no. But everyone leaves with their brains working, with their hearts beating faster, thinking of the urgent need of making change, right? So I'd like to end by going back to John Stuart Mill and, and highlighting a quotation by him, and I leave you, leave you to think about it. This was said in, 19, uh, 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 in, in 1859, but I believe it's especially relevant today. He said, I am not aware that any community has the right to force another to be civilized. Let's just pause and think about this. Please join me in thanking my panelists. And a big thank you to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you agree with me that it's a very thought-provoking session that we had earlier and definitely worth taking note and from all the multitude of perspective that we had from our panelists and our speaker. May I now invite Mr. James So, Executive Director of the National Youth Achievement Award Council and Organizing Chairman of the 5th Singalan Symposium Singapore Forum 2020 to present token appreciations to our guest speaker, panelists and moderator. Mr. So, please. Professor Danny Kwa. <laughs> Mr. Warren Fernandez. <laughs> the young gentleman in big shoes to feel Mr. Tommy Cole. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Vishwa Sarasivan, our moderator for today. Thank you, Mr. So, and our distinguished uh, panelists and speaker. We'll now take a group picture. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like, I'd now like to invite Ms. Valerie Happy, member of the International Student Committee 2020, University of St. Gallens, to tell us a little bit more about the St. Gallens Symposium Wing of Excellence Award in May this year. Ms. Happy, please. The floor. I also want to thank all of our panelists, Mr. Warren Fernandez, Professor Dani Kwa, Mr. Tommy Ko, and our moderator, Mr. Wiswa Sarasivan, for this great and lovely panel discussion. And of course, I would like to thank our topic um, keynote speaker, Dr. Te Dr. Kevin Tan, for sharing some valuable insights and personal experiences about Freedom Revisited. My name is Valerie Hüppi, and I'm this year's responsible for Singapore in the International Students Committee for the 50th St. Gallen Symposium. The 50th St. Gallen Symposium is organized by a team of students of 35 students, which I am honored to be a part of. Our goal is to foster intergenerational and international debates about an annually changing topic. So today, I will begin by presenting you a little more about the St. Gallen Symposium itself, its participants groups, as well as our program, and to finish it off, I will inform you more about the Global Essay Competition. 
But first, I would like to talk about our 50th St. Gallen Symposium, the Great Jubilee Year. The St. Gallen Symposium is the leading initiative for international and intergenerational debates on economics, political and social developments, and has taken place since 1969. In the late 60s, student protests took place across the world, which all shared one common theme. The beliefs of the younger generation did not match those of the older generational political leaders and business heads. In our time, these issues have further developed in regards to environmental issues, political uncertainty, and privacy in the digital age. Our founders strive to take these issues and created a platform where they are brought to light and discussed in a form of a constructive dialogue between promising young minds and leaders of today. So for our Jubilee, the 50th St. Gallen Symposium, we will be inviting 300 brilliant young minds, the younger generation of the symposium, our so-called leaders of tomorrow as well as over 600 influential world leaders from different fields, such as economics, politics, and from the society. The senior leaders represent the most powerful decision makers of today's world and support us as participants or as partners of the St. Gallen Symposium. Besides those two generations, we additionally have the so-called aspiring leaders. As a partner of the St. Gallen Symposium, you have the possibility of bringing an aspiring leader, a high potential from your own company with you, who can get in touch with all the leaders of tomorrow and also all the senior leaders at the symposium itself. In the past years, we had the honor of welcoming guests such as Foreman, Shan Mugaratnam, Christine Lagarde, Kofi Annan, and so on. And last year, at the 49th St. Gallen Symposium, we had the great honor of welcoming Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Singapore, Mr. Heng Sui Kiat. As Dr. Yap already shared his thoughts about our topic, Freedom Revisited, I would now like to show you a topic video which gives you some more insights from our side. Enjoy. The world needs a reset because our planet is in danger. The new generation is marching for our future. They call for action. But diverse stakeholders, politics, economics and societies worldwide are not joining for a global commitment. Society's freedom is under attack. As globalism opens up the business world, new aggressive market strategies emerge and traditional capitalism comes under fire. Ominously, individual interests rule the game. Globalism means that some people do better than ever before and some people do worse than before. That has to cause problems. While some countries take responsibility for the global community, others call for separation and isolation. Walls are being built. Freedom is in danger. The Principality of Liechtenstein can look back on a very long and successful history, mainly thanks also to an open dialogue between the generations on long-term issues and values. Such a dialogue is today more important than ever. Therefore, I am very happy and proud to be able to participate at the 50th St. Gallen Symposium as it offers an excellent platform for such a dialogue. We need to reset our bearings, take a stance against isolation and fear. Open your mind. Global solutions are needed to create a prosperous future for the planet and all its people. We have to take responsibility to be free. Today's Young have got a unique opportunity because for the first time ever there's a world education system based on the world language of English. So they can speak to each other, they study in each other's universities, they're connected. The danger is that they become increasingly divorced from their fellow citizens at home. 
50 years after founding the St. Gallen Symposium, we must now recalibrate. Freedom Revisited. So, as you have now heard a lot about Freedom Revisited, I would like to present you some of our yet confirmed speakers for the 50th St. Gallen Symposium. We will there welcome business leaders such as Mr. Ola Kalinius, who is chairman of the board of management of Daimler and Mercedes-Benz, or Mr. Mark Schneider, who is chief executive officer of Nestle, or Ms. Tabata Amaral, who is federal, federal deputy for Sao Paulo in the Brazilian Senate and fights for education and equality. Now, I would like to share you a bit more about the global essay competition and share some reasons why you should apply in it. Well, the St. Gallen Symposium may be a life-changing conference for you because you meet a lot of inspirational personalities from all around the world. As a leader of tomorrow, you're not only granted, to ch the, granted the chance to participate in this unique world-class conference, but also to become a member of our unique community. A community that remains connected years after years to share their great ideas. Also today, some formal leaders of tomorrow from Singapore are actually here. This community is really unique and totally friendly, I can tell by myself, because in my first day here in Singapore last year, I met several times with some formal leaders of tomorrow from Singapore, and also before I went back home for Christmas break, we had a, list, had a little pre-Christmas dinner all together. So with your essay, you can really share your thoughts about Freedom Revisited and also at the conference itself. You're able to be a part of the 50th St. Gallen Symposium to be a part of all these discussions. The costs of the trip to lovely Switzerland and the participation in the symposium will be fully covered by us. So furthermore, if you're in the top three of the winners of the St. Gallen Wings of Excellence Award, you will also get a prize money of about 20,000 Swiss francs split amongst the three winners. So now speaking of the winners, here you can see our lucky winners from last year. Mr. Royben Muhindi Wambui from Kenya in the middle, Ms. Natalie Hai Tung Lao from Hong Kong at the left, and Mr. Tuan Do from Vietnam at the right. So as you were now a bit more informed about the Global Essay Competition, I would like to introduce you to the topic of next year. So as we have the big topic, Freedom Revisited, we have also a glo Global Essay Competition question, which, sa which says, which aspects of freedom need to be defended or recalibrated to meet the challenges of our time? So what we really want to know is which aspects of freedom need to be defended or otherwise recalibrated to meet challenges you see in your daily life or around the world. So make up your mind and start writing. But before you get into it, before you do that, I will show you what it does require to participate in the com competition and also how you can do it. So to be eligible to participate in this unique opportunity, in this unique competition, you must meet these criteria. Firstly, you have to respond to the essay question in two 2,000 up to 2,100 words, and the essay must be written in English. Furthermore, you have to be born in 1990 or later, and you need to be enrolled in a graduate or postgraduate program. And lastly, you must submit your essay before the 1st February of 2020. So with all I said, I really want to encourage you, the students here in this audience, to write an essay and get under the best 100 students to become a part of the 50th St. Gallen Symposium. It will be a unique experience for you and you will definitely never regret it. So if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact me. I hope that we can show the last slide right over there later. Or approach me later at the buffet lunch. And if you're interested in the Global Essay Competition, come to me or go to our website and yeah, start writing. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Valerie. And when she said 1990, that broke my heart, right? <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to now invite Mr. Alexander C. Melcher, General Manager of C. Melcher and Company and Special Advisor to the St. Gallen Foundation to deliver the closing address. Mr. Melcher, please.
Um, the ambassador is not here anymore, otherwise I would have started. The ambassador, dear panel, um, Valerie, very good recovery without the charts. Congratulations. Um, the, we need to talk. Um, this was what you said, and this was also how the student team at the last symposium opened up the symposium. Um, and um, it's, um, for me, it's striking this topic, Freedom Revisited. Um, when you read it the first time, it, it doesn't click. It's like Freedom Revisited, what does it, what is it? But if you think about it, um, five minutes, it's like kind of an explosion of thoughts. And I think this is also what we saw here today at, this, um, at the panel. It was a fantastic discussion. Um, really insightful, and I really learned a lot. Um, I have to, I still want to put us back um, 50 years um, ago when students started the symposium. This was in 1969. Um, and Kennedy was just murdered, um, and he was challenging conventions. Um, they were going to the moon. Apollo 10 was the first uh, mission, manned mission. Um, Nixon um, took over from Johnson. Vietnam War was raging, um, and the um, and you had Woodstock, Beatles were playing, and um, people were challenging the concept of trust, freedom, and liberty. And um, there were large demonstrations um, in, in Europe, and student revolts and upheavals. And these students at St. Gallen um, took the same decision that Tommy would have taken. That means we have to have dialogue and not demonstrate. They said, um, we start this. And this is how it all started, um, notably, um, and the, the environment was also on the agenda at that time. Out of the first St. Gallen Symposium resulted um, the initiative, which was the Club of Rome. And the first Club of Rome report, Limits to Growth, um, was actually launched at the St. Gallen Symposium in 1972. Um, so it's a, a huge déjà vu if you think about it, what is happening today. Greta, Hong Kong, yellow vests, um, demonstrations. So um, this topic couldn't be um, more aptly chosen. Um, and I congratulate the team, um, St. Gallen team. Now, um, some of you are um, not, don't qualify to write the essay, um, 1990, uh, maybe the age of, maybe you're not a student, but um, please also um, consider to participate um, at the symposium. You are invited to um, join the symposium. We are looking always for sponsors and partners. Um, since the symposium um, started, or since we started the initiative here in Singapore, we have brought more than 300 Singaporean students to the St. Gallen Symposium for this all-paid trip. So the St. Gallen Symposium also really contributes to interchange and exchange between um, our countries, Switzerland and Singapore, and, um, um, the, and giving Singaporean students a fantastic platform to um, learn and to meet people and to be exposed. Um, this has to be paid for. Um, this doesn't come from the budget of the students, and um, I always encourage um, also the corporate leaders to join this um, symposium and to become a partner. So with that, I want to um, thank Valerie. You know, she's a student. She's taking time off her um, um, student um, um, curriculum. Um, the whole team, 20 of them, take a year off. Um, we have an office here in Singapore. Um, and they promote the St. Gallen Symposium. They meet um, corporate leaders and students and um, politicians and encourage them to join. And it's a huge effort. And I want to thank you, Valerie, and your colleagues and your team in the name of um, the Singapore side um, to make that effort. And lastly, really to thank James um, for the cooperation for setting this up. So with that, please continue the dialogue out there and um, um, a big hand to the panel for the very contentful discussion. Thank you.